Welcome to the MSDN Show. In the last few episodes, we've talked about the .NET architecture, as well as the framework. Well, in today's episode, we're going to talk about C Sharp. C Sharp is a special programming language that was specifically designed to incorporate the base capabilities that the .NET architecture exposes. We'll assist you in understanding how this language can assist you in developing great applications. But before we get to that, let's go check in with Erica and the news. Hello, I'm Erica Wickers. Welcome to the MSDN News Update. The Internet Engineering Task Force is midway through an estimated 10-year effort to develop a new Internet protocol. The update is being driven primarily by the fact that the Internet, largely due to the explosion of non-PC devices in recent years, is running out of IP addresses. The codes assigned to every Internet-enabled device, allowing connected systems to find each other. The new IP standard is being referred to as IPv6. For more information, check out the show transcript for the URL to the full press release on the new IP standard, as well as for a link to download the IPv6 technology preview for Windows 2000. When Microsoft.com launched Search 2.5 back in July, they were also quietly porting their code to the .NET framework. Take a look at the steps they took to tackle that project with links to code samples and a version of the .NET-based tool at www.microsoft.com slash backstage slash bkst underscore column underscore 25 dot htm. In October, Microsoft released SQL Server 2000 Windows CE Edition. SQL Server CE is the compact database that has the familiar feel of SQL Server with tools, APIs, and SQL grammar that minimize development time. For more information on SQL Server CE, including requirements to download, check out www.microsoft.com slash SQL slash product info slash coverview.htm. On October 31st, Microsoft released the long-awaited production version of MSXML 3.0 parser. MSXML 3.0 offers a significant advancement over the MSXML 2.5 parser that was released with Microsoft Windows 2000, including complete implementation of the W3C standards for XSLT and XPath. More information about MSXML 3.0 can be found at msdn.microsoft.com xml. Also on October 31st, Microsoft announced the first beta release of the next version of the Windows operating system, codename Whistler. The Beta 1 release will be distributed to key partners and customers, as well as to more than 200,000 software developers via MSDN. The objective is to gather feedback and enable compatibility testing. Both desktop and server versions of Whistler are expected to be generally available in the second half of 2001. For more information, check out the show transcript for the URL to the full press release on the Whistler beta. And that's been the MSDN News Update. I'm Erica Wickers. Welcome back. Now, like any platform you develop applications for, one of the primary things you need in order to get those applications to actually run is a language. Now, .NET has a special language we've developed for it called C Sharp. With me here today is Anders Heilsberg. He's a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, and he played a pivotal role in the C Sharp language as well as in the .NET platform. You've all seen him before on the show, and so I brought him back to help talk with us about C Sharp, what it is, and what programmers can take advantage of with it, and how it really affects the development of applications. Right. So, um, what exactly have you done with C Sharp, and when did you get started working with it? Well, we've been working uh, on C Sharp for the last probably two and a half years. It's been a design group of, of four people, um, uh, and it's been you know my major focus for for those two and a half years. Um, there are many there are many things we wanted to do with with a new programming language. Um, you know, I, I I think primarily probably is simplify life for, for programmers, make programmers more productive is ultimately what it comes down to. Now that gain in productivity sort of takes many shapes, but you could say that we've, we've targeted with C Sharp, in a sense, the power and expressiveness of C++, but with the ease of use and productivity of RAD languages. Um, some of the things we've done, um, for example, come into the categories of uh, 
of giving programmers access to better, a better tool for writing components. If you look at how we write applications, or actually if you look at how we used to write applications, if you go back say five or ten years, it used to be that applications were built as sort of these big monolithical things and about the only interaction it had with the operating system other than, you know, doing Philo and whatever was that the operating system would launch it and then the user would interact, interact with the application, you'd shut it down again. If you look at how we build applications today uh, for the internet, it's actually a, a very different world. Apps are not monolithical things, rather they are sort of composed of a bunch of smaller components that sit in various hosting environments. You could, for example, take, um, you know, you might have components that, uh, for example, such as stored procedures in SQL Server, you might have controls hosted in a browser, you might have code sitting in an ASP page, business objects living on a middle tier. Um, and you call sort of that whole congregation of components is what you call your application. Now, in order to in make that... Case, each one of those components is more complex than an application used to be. Oh, absolutely, like five, ten years absolutely. Ago. Um, and so, so to make them less complex to build, unlike big monolithical applications, you don't want to start from scratch every time you have to build one of these components. Rather, you want to sort of be able to inherit from something that already exists in the particular hosting environment. You want to inherit from, inherit from a base control you know, if you're writing a control in a browser, you want to inherit from, you know, some core business object class if you're writing a business object on the middle tier. And you want to expose things um, from these components like properties and methods and events. You want to say something about how they integrate with the hosting environment through attributes that you attach to the component. And you want to be able to write documentation for the components you alongside know, with the components. All this is just standard object-oriented programming that's been around well, for quite some time with small talk. And it, absolutely. And, and it's not that you can't do these things today. Um, but if you look at the programming languages that are, that are in widespread use today, they don't actually really support component-oriented concepts. If you look at, say, C++, when well, if first, if you, if you accept, you know, that when we talk about components, it is very common today to think of them as having properties and methods and events. Um, but if you look at C++, there's really only the notion of methods there. There are no properties. There are no events. Now, you can emulate them by having naming patterns that says, you know, for a property, instead of having a color property, you have a get color and a set color method. And instead of having, you know, events as a first class member, in a class, you have interfaces that, you know, someone wanting to receive the event have to implement, and so there's a bunch of housekeeping that you have to go through well, in, in order to do C, that. C++ is, is based on C, and it's like a preprocessor thing, yes. and C didn't support that inherently, C++ yeah, I, couldn't inherently. I actually sort of think that, that what you're seeing is, is an evolution from C to C++ to C sharp. From C to C++, um, the concept of object-oriented programming was added. If you go from C++ to C Sharp, I would say that the concept of component-oriented programming has been added. And, and there's really an analogy. Just like you could do uh, object-oriented programming in C um, instead of C++, so can you do component-oriented programming in C++ instead of C Sharp. It's just harder. It's a lot harder in C to do object-oriented programming. You have to manually lay out your V tables and do all sorts of housekeeping. And the same is true in C++. You can write components. but you have to manually sort of have naming patterns for your properties. You have to manually implement event syncs. You have to have external idle files where you describe your hosting attributes. You have to have external documentation files and so forth. And we really just sort of taking that next logical step that reflects how people write applications and folded it into the language. So you get one-stop programming, so to speak. So then what were some of the... Um Initial objectives, from just from a mental thinking standpoint, when you first started this project, of mm -hmm. the the problems you wanted to solve and the direction you wanted to take this this new language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, as I said, you know, the component orientation is one thing. I think another key factor is simplification. Just make it simpler to write application. Don't make programmers do the housekeeping that the machine could do for you. Now, a lot of that simplification lies in the in the .NET runtime itself, but a lot of it lies in in the language as well. Um, and basically, in the end, what we do is we, we give you more time to focus on the algorithms and we let the system do the housekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of other things that were very key was sort of the realization that 
we can't just tell people to throw away all of their existing code. We have to find a way to leverage not just your skills, but also the code that you've written before, uh, that, that, that exists already. Um, so in terms of leveraging your skills, we've tried to stay very close and very true to, to you know, the underlying um, syntax of C++ in C Sharp. So any C++ programmer will immediately feel familiar and at home with, with C Sharp. Now, I was think. that one of the original thoughts you were going to take and, and do something that was one step above C, or did you originally think, let's just throw out everything, let's just start with a brand new language? Well, I, I think we did start with a blank slate, but we knew that we wanted you know, C and C++ programmers to feel familiar with, with this language. Um, that, of course, meant that, you know, sort of statement structure, we weren't going to go change that from being curly braces to being something something else you know we so there was sort of a foundation laid there already mm -hmm. but there were some other key tenets um, like allowing you to write robust software um, and that means things like garbage collection exception handling type safety that fundamentally alter how you design the language and are very hard to come in and sprinkle on later I mean in C++ um, one of the one of the strengths of the C++ language, but also sometimes one of the hard parts about it, is the fact that, you know, there is no type safety. Um, now, if you know what you're doing, that gives you tremendous power, but if you don't, you know, you, you can get in trouble. Um, it is very easy in C++ to have a dangling pointer. Um, it's very easy to override over the end of an array or to have an uninitialized variable and so forth. And we wanted to solve some of those problems. Um, and I think that you can't just start with C++ and sprinkle it on. You really have to sort of take a step back, but then continue, but, but create your design in the spirit of C++, which is sort of what we've done. What about um, other languages? Did you look at what other languages are doing, whether, you know, Pascal, Modular 2, oh, and absolutely. Ford, and borrow things from those? Oh, we looked at, I mean, well, I come myself from a strong Pascal background, so uh, naturally, you know, looking at Pascal, Modular, Operon, um, looking at Smalltalk, looked at Java, looked at C++, um, looked at a whole range of languages, you know, that, that exist and are in, in, in use today, more or less widespread, so. What are some of the features in those languages you felt that they were doing something better than C and C++ were that you needed to, to bring into this new language? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, one of the things that I, for example, always have liked about Smalltalk um, is the notion that in, in that language, everything is an object. Um, now, this, this gives you tremendous simplification because it doesn't matter what piece of data you're holding, you can carry it from point A to point B as an object. Anything can sort of operate on it generically. You can put it in a container just typed as an object. Now, in the actual implementation uh, in Smalltalk, there are some pretty heavy uh, performance overhead associated with, with how they do it. For example, in Smalltalk, when you operate on floating point numbers, for every new number you produce, you know, when you add 1.0 and 2.0 together, you allocate a new object that, that contains the value 3.0. And that's, of course, a very expensive way of doing it. Um, now, we've done some, some innovative work um, uh, in C-sharp that allows you to get the same benefits, but without the overhead. As long as you treat your floats as floats, you know, as you, you say, or double, you know, you use the type double, there is no cost. But you can treat them as objects. And at that point, they get heap allocated, but only if you do so. Um, so there's some nice unification there that gives you, you know, a lot of the benefits without the, the performance overhead. Mm -hmm. What about uh, some of the structures of mm -hmm. the end result of what happens at a C-sharp? So you've got this, you know, text file C-sharp program, mm -hmm. and then you compile it. What about some of the issues of the compiler itself? Um, how are some of the designs built into that to be more effective and use what some of the other languages might have done? And then even the, the binary executable that comes out at the mm -hmm. bottom end. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done some things with respect to just how you write your code. Um, if, you're a, if you're a C++ programmer, you, you, you're, of course, familiar with how you, you, know, you have in C++ a separation of declaration and implementation. So you write all your declarations in H files that you then pound include in other modules, and then you write your, your actual implementation in CPP files. Um, in C Sharp, you write both in the same place. So you write your declaration, and then you immediately write your code in there as well. Um, well, and that then, but then what if you need to take and use some values declared in your main file in mm -hmm. some other file? Uh -huh. Well, so what happens then when you compile is that instead of just producing x86 machine code that has nothing but the executable code in it, we actually produce code that has both the, or we produce an output file that has both the code and the metadata, the symbol tables, or the 
associated symbolic information. In a sense, the code becomes self-describing. So when you want to use one piece of code from another piece of code, you simply reference that other code. And the code is self-describing enough that we know what classes are in there, what members do the classes have, you know, what are the methods you can call, what are the properties, what are the type names, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So would, would that be like a, you're pointing at the .obj file or the .exe file? Well, or? You're, you're actually, well, the format we use in .NET is a PE format. Um, so it, you could point at another .exe or at another .dll. We, we call those assemblies now, and, and we basically use that word sort of broadly to describe these super DLLs, if you will, that contain not just code, but also information that, that talks about what is in the code and also, indeed, talks about what other assemblies this code references. Mm -hmm. And by code, you mean binary code or executable well, actually, code? Well, actually, we don't produce directly executable x86 machine code. Rather, we produce MSIL, which is the intermediate language that .NET defines and that it provides JIT compilers for. Okay, so you've got a, an executable per se mm -hmm. that is this intermediate language as well as the metadata associated to it. And if I want to use that one in my application, I just point to it and say, hey, I want to borrow these classes, borrow these objects, and use in my own thing like that. Exactly. Now, this, this reminds me of a, of a problem I've heard a couple of people mention, is that there's um, a concern that if they've got an intermediate language, that the potential exists that someone else can take and grab that file and mm -hmm. decompile it mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and get back to the original source code and therefore know all the intellectual property rights associated with the developer. Right. What, what are some of the issues there? Well, first of all, you can actually do that with DLLs today. It's, it's just probably a bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, but you could take you know, a DLL containing x86 machine code and decompile it into assembler, at least. Mm -hmm. um, you can do the same. I used to do that with, with Apple II all the time. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, and you can do the same with, with, with .NET DLLs and, and decompile them into MSIL. Um, you, they're not decompilable directly into C-sharp, although you could probably also finagle that problem. It's, it's much harder. Um, now, the thing that's different is that there's a lot more symbolic information associated with, uh, with the code um, produced by C-sharp or with, you know, an MSI, uh, sorry, a, a .NET assembly. Um, for example, you, you know, you can learn from the code what classes are in here, what are their members, and, and so forth. Um, it's, it's a tough problem to solve because there are so many advantages to having the code be self-describing. But the fact that the code carries around a description of itself also makes it somewhat easier to understand what, what the code does with a decompilation tool. Now, we're looking at this problem. Um, uh, basically, what we're looking to do is build what's known as an obfuscator, you know, that will, that will go in and mangle your code around so it becomes next to illegible, yet still preserves the same public interface. Um, yeah, because the problem you've got is that you want that code to be understandable by compilers and so forth like that, but you don't want them to be understandable at that same level by individuals who want to take and write these exactly. compiler programs. Exactly. Now, I do want to point out that, that it, for a small application, it might actually be possible for you to decompile it, and, and given enough time and resources, you could even understand what it does. For a real-world application, this is quite an undertaking. And in reality, you're probably better off running the app, understanding what it does, and then writing a copy of it. You know, you'd get there sooner. So you'd Probably so, write a better you know. program anyway, right? Because you're a better <laughs> program, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are some of the issues about, about C-sharp that our audience may need to understand in order to figure out whether they want to start implementing the next project in C-sharp or not? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, first of all, you need to think about where you're coming from. If you have an existing body of code, and let's say it's written in C++ already, um, probably your shortest path to moving that code to the .NET framework is to use Manage C++, the C++ compiler that, that we're shipping with .NET. However, if you're looking at writing new code, be that either, you know, sort of new modules, larger modules that go into an application, or a whole new application, and you are skilled in C++, then I would recommend that you, that you look at C Sharp. So we're not necessarily saying that everyone needs to rewrite their applications in C Sharp. We're saying that people need to understand the type of project they're currently working on, whether it's an existing project, mm -hmm. legacy code, mm -hmm. and sometimes write some of those components in C Sharp, but they can use C Sharp and C++ interchangeable? Oh, well, I, absolutely. Uh, first of all, if you just have existing code that is written, say, in using really any, any language that's supported by, you know, the Windows platform today, um, compiled either into COM components or into DLLs, we give you great interoperability with that code. Um, now, if you're writing 
code specifically uh, for the .NET framework, new code for the .NET framework. Um, you can indeed write it in any of the languages that are supported by the .NET framework. We're going to be shipping four languages um, uh, with Visual Studio .NET, um, C Sharp, C++, Visual Basic, and JScript. But uh, in cooperation with the industry and academia, I think at latest count, this may not be a precise count, but I think the total is at about 17 different languages now oh. targeting that platform, um, ranging all the way from, you know, APL to COBOL. What about uh, something like Fortran? Um, I believe there is work in progress for, I, I don't know precisely yeah. who's, who's building that Fortran compiler. But the, but the key thing here is, and we've actually, we've demonstrated it many times, um, um, but you could write, you know, a base class in C-sharp, inherit from it in C++, and use a VB program to create instances of it. It's, it's that seamless to do that, in it, that, to do that interoperability between the different languages. And that's something that I think really sets apart the .NET framework from other, you know, uh, other competitive products in, in the industry. And that it takes and allows multiple languages to interoperate exactly. on level footing. At a, yes, but at a very high level. I mean, you could argue that today languages can interoperate, you know. It's just at a very low level with, you know, DLL entry points and structs with pointers in them or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a much higher semantic level, you know, at the object-oriented level, mm -hmm. if you will, you know, with classes and interfaces and so forth. Is, is C-sharp considered a proprietary language for Microsoft? Actually, no. We... we in, in cooperation with industry partners, in, in, uh, in particular with uh, HP and Intel, um, we made a proposal to a European standards organization called ECMA um, uh, earlier this year to standardize C Sharp and uh, something called the CLI, which stands for the Common Language Infrastructure. Um, and that's similar kind of to the C runtime and the VB runtime. Stuff like well, that. actually, it is. It is a large subset of the .NET framework. It is, in a sense, all of those parts of .NET that could be moved to other platforms, um, meaning that, for example, it does not include, you know, any Windows-specific UI library, for example, because, you know, that would not mm -hmm. be of, of much interest to other platforms. Things like memory but, management? And well, garbage. memory, absolutely, memory management, you know, I mean, a large portion of the class library is included in the CLI. Mm -hmm. um, we made this proposal to ECMA in September. It was adopted at an ECMA meeting, um, and and work is now underway to formulate these two standards: one for C sharp and one for a common language infrastructure. So, what does it mean then for C sharp to be a, a standard through ECMA? Then, um, well, it means that other industry partners can and most likely will go implement this language on different platforms. So if I was someone like you know like, like Boeing or something like that, and I had some you know old PDP 1170, and I wanted to get C# -sharp running on it, mm -hmm. I could take it under myself to use the ECMAS standards and create my own compiler for my old legacy computers. Mm -hmm. If someone else wasn't already going to be mm -hmm. doing that sort mm -hmm. of thing, absolutely. Um, now C# -sharp, now the two standards are actually submitted hand in hand, and C Sharp itself currently doesn't specify a runtime library. Rather, it relies on the .NET framework, or when we're talking about the standard submission, it relies on the common language infrastructure to provide the, the runtime infrastructure and the class libraries for, for the language. Um, we're currently working with the standardization organization and our industry partners to determine precisely what the lowest bar is of requirement is, is going to be. You know, obviously, you know, the CLI will be divided into various levels. Indeed, the submission that we, we, we gave to ECMA is divided into various levels, starting at a very low kernel level, where really you just have some of the core data types, some very, you, you know, simple things like arrays and, and whatever. You know, all of, sort of the, all of the atoms are there, but, mm -hmm. you know, the molecules are not necessarily there. They're built in higher levels of the stack. And so for embedded devices, you could actually end up with a very lightweight environment that you could, you could move to different platforms. So a version of C-sharp that I could run on my, my wristwatch or something well, like that? Well, in theory, yes. Yeah. Yes, or your refrigerator or, you know, wherever you... Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, to a certain extent, is the whole goal of, of the .NET framework, is allowing this, this programming infrastructure to exist on multiple different types of devices so that one device can talk to another device and borrowing the services and support across them, mm -hmm. uh, either connected via network or Bluetooth or something like that. Well, y yes, that, that's part of it. I, I think 
Now, now it's important to keep in mind, though, that when you talk about distributed applications or devices talking to each other, that the infrastructure that we put in place in the .NET framework, and indeed also in, in CLI, actually does not require on, on .NET being present on both ends of the wire. Uh, rather, the, the architecture that we recommend and indeed lead you towards when you use our class libraries to build your applications is entirely based on industry standards like XML and SOAP. And you can indeed you know, implement it on you know, a Linux, Linux box, say, with Java and an Apache web server and you know, build, build that other side of the equation using other tools, if you like. So in my C-sharp application, if I was writing it to connect to a, an external service, mm -hmm. I could treat the just standard C-sharp calls and so forth, and then external service running on a different machine, you know, could be, you know, Amazon.com or some other system mm -hmm. like that that's, mm -hmm. that's not running Windows, not running C-sharp. That, sharp, that is precisely the whole vision of, of web services. And Indeed. all that I do is just implement SOAP. Yes, well, I mean, basically what we would do is we would use the existing internet infrastructure, meaning, you know, the carrying protocol is HTTP, the payload is SOAP formatted XML, um, and indeed there could be anything on the other side of the wire. Now, we will actually, we have the ability to make this XML and these SOAP calls look like objects with methods when you access them from C Sharp. But, but, you know, and we give you sort of all of the infrastructure to turn method calls into XML uh, SOAP bodies that go mm -hmm. across the wire and come back and get unpackaged again, you know, through all of the serialization infrastructure that we have in the .NET framework. Now, you're saying you've been working on C-sharp for mm -hmm. a couple of years now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, XML had about the same life cycle, so that means they, neither one of them kind of knew about the other when they got started. Well, XML's probably been around a little longer than that. SOAP is, is fairly new and has evolved in parallel with C-sharp and in parallel with the .NET framework, and it's, you know, we are actively heavily involved in, in these uh, standardization bodies through the uh, W3C. Um, and we are tracking that and, you know, will continuously adhere to, to the latest standards. So was this level of interconnectivity between SOAP and XML, was that originally one of the aspects of, of C-sharp, or was that something kind of evolved as the language evolved? Well, I think there's actually sort of a separation here. Most of the infrastructure that is required to do XML and SOAP is provided by uh, the .NET framework, not by the C-sharp language. Now, the C-sharp language builds on top of the .NET framework and gives you great access to, to these things. Um, for example, uh, through this, this thing that we have in C-sharp called attributes, you can directly in your code express, you know, what is the mapping from this class instance to an XML formatted mm -hmm. body that goes across the internet. So I can, for example, say for this field, I would like this field to become this XML element with this name. I would like this class name to become this tag name in XML and so forth. And we allow you to do that directly integrated in, in, your, in your source code through attributes. Um, so that's one of the things that, that, you know, makes it a lot easier to use XML with C-Sharp. Mm -hmm. So just can they just fit really well together? They do indeed, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when thinking about the, the design of an application, um, is there a different way I want to conceptually work my application up in order to use C Sharp better, or is it just the same sort of mental flow that I'd normally have in a C application? Well, I think one, one of the key tenets, you know, is that you are now programming in a deeply object-oriented fashion and even in a component-oriented fashion when you're using C Sharp. So, so you might tend to think of your application design a little differently. Now, if you're using C++, you would probably still think of, you know, writing objects and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, when you're writing in C Sharp, you may, for example, think about, geez, am I writing a component? Well, is this component going to need to have the ability to go on a toolbox in Visual Studio so I can drag it onto a form or onto a business object or onto a web page. And, you know, is it going to be then shown in a property inspector? Well, geez, then what properties should I have in there? And how do I control what goes in the drop-down list? And should I have a special editor for that? Now, we give you all of that infrastructure, you know, but it, it makes you think about your, your design differently mm -hmm. uh, than, than you traditionally would when you just wrote C++ code. So, for the most part, it's just you're still writing an application. You just have more capabilities to expose, depending on how you embellish your application. Um, you could say that, yeah, yeah. yeah.
What about the whole notion of, of being more of a, of a service-oriented sort of thing? So I'm writing more, um, almost a non-GUI application mm -hmm. running on a server, and I'm mm -hmm. going to be attacking it with a with a web client and coming mm -hmm. at it asking for responses to track a package or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, does that change the mindset at all, or is that still just the same server-side orientation? Well, I think it, it, in a sense, makes you think a little bit more about abstractions in, in your applications. You know, you, you, would, you would tend to think more about how do I, you know, how do I... Uh, layer my application into a business logic tier and a presentation tier? How do I put APIs on my business logic such that it can either be used by my presentation logic to mm -hmm. present HTML or a client-based UI or even just be direct entry points for web services that go over the web? So, so there's, you know, you, you tend to think about that a little bit more, I would think. So, so as I said earlier, you know, you're not just writing these monolithical things anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as lending itself more towards people using other people's components a lot easier than they have today? I remember like, you know, when I used to work at Boeing, uh, we had this, this big uh, thing going on about code reuse. Mm -hmm. and we had to take and make sure that any application we wrote, any code we wrote, was specifically designed for code reuse. And while in, in thought it sounded like a great idea, in practice, it never quite ended up being utilized that well because it was just right. really hard to reuse right. someone else's right. code. Right. Do you think this might actually enable that better? I, I, I think it will. I, I think that the thing, the, the key operative here is actually for that is the .NET framework. It is the fact that we have defined this substrate upon which you can build components. And we say a lot about, you know, how you put them into classes, how you make them components, you know. We give you strong decide guidelines, and indeed the whole framework serves as an example of that. But key to it is that it is uniformly accessible from a variety of programming languages. So the problem you talked about here, for example, if, it's some, if some guy is writing some language or some, some library in COBOL and you want to use it from C++, you know, it's going to be very hard. Mm -hmm. We're actually giving you a substrate that allows you, that allows you to do that kind of interoperability. Um, so you definitely stand a much better chance of having your components interoperate. Because in reality, the thing that's often hard for people is that components are written with different design philosophies or at different abstraction levels, and that what, that's what confuses people. They are not accustomed to this style of API, and so they get lost in, you know, they get lost in the, in the infrastructure, you know, they can't see the forest for the trees, if, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, and so by, by saying a lot about, you know, how you write components and giving you a consistently available API and infrastructure for writing these components, you stand a much better chance of getting better reusability. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that sounds like a pretty good explanation. Uh, are there any uh, final closing words you think are important for an audience to understand in order to grasp the, the architectural importance of C-sharp as a language? Well, I think the best, way to, the best way to do that is to play with it yourself. So I would, I would urge people to, to download it from, from our site, um, and I'm sure you could, you could give them the, the address. Download it, play with it, write some examples, join our, our, our you know, user groups um, or our news groups, talk to other people that have, that have used it, you know, see what, what their experiences are, and I, I, think you'll, I think you'll have a good time. Okay, I'll be sure to put a, a link at the bottom of the transcript to where they can download mm -hmm. uh, the current version of the C-sharp uh, runtime and the .NET stuff that, mm -hmm. that we gave out at the PDC, and I guess we have a, we another have a version. Beta 1 coming out. Beta 1 coming yes, out pretty yes. quick, um, as well as a link to the news groups that you mentioned. Yes, um, yes. So make sure you send me some email with those news we'll groups, do. and I'll, we'll uh, <laughs> I'll set that up. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Anders. Uh, well, I'm, I know I appreciated talking with you, and I hope our audience appreciated hearing mm -hmm. about from someone that actually helped design the C-sharp language and what that means for developing applications with. Mm -hmm. So um, after this short break, uh, we'll take and we'll come back and actually talk with a programmer who's been developing applications using C Sharp for quite some time now and find out what he thinks about the language and any hints he might have that help you develop your own applications using C Sharp. So stay tuned. Man, it was like heavy metal trash cans singing along the groovy interstices of some hepcat webman. Screaming through the purple sirens of the city, awake at 4.30 a.m., moonlit night, blanketing the yard, dogs howling in the trees, and I was spinning through sights, plowing through pages, growling through the gifts, my eyes like tiny red raisins, blotchy wrinkled corneas, 
flat, featureless, hypertextual boneyards of unmeaning, the waves unheard and the flat files flushed at the mercy of the hellion webmaster of Freddy's cow insurance homepage. When my browser crashed through some weirdo mysterioso packet barrier man, and there I was on this cool, cool page, a sweet, delirious, munificent page, tagged and titled before and after tables nested deep and deeper in the collective subconscious of the killer site and its creators, seeking enlightenment and dynamic HTML, seduced by the object model of a thousand nights of ecstasy, besmooched by Scheherazade, besought by the cyber cam in the valley of the shadow of the moon of Mars. And there it was, just now visible as it blasted through a cut through black, uncover down, split vertical out transition, filters screaming, letters a mile high, flames mounting in my medulla oblongata, the words flooded my brain, man. Worldwide live, the web, the way you want it. Welcome back. We're now going to take and deal with some of the programming aspects associated with C-sharp. And to assist us in understanding some of that, I have with me a good friend of mine, Jeffrey Richter. Now, Jeffrey happens to be a programmer that has written a number of programming books. Um, this is the most current one. It is called Programming Server-Side Applications for Windows, Microsoft Windows 2000. Mm -hmm. Now, you also are a consultant, and you have your own uh, company, uh, Wintelect. Wintelect, right. Um, I suppose you have a website. Yes, at wintelect.com. Okay. So uh, we, we specialize in training, debugging, a yeah, little ad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I understand lately you've been doing a lot with C Sharp. Yeah, it's been um, over a year now that I've been pretty much programming exclusively in C Sharp. No, wait, for a year now? I thought, I thought we just released C Sharp. Yeah, but I've been on the inside track, if you will, <laughs> within Microsoft. <laughs> and uh, I set myself up a little office in Building 42 and... Um, had been studying it and working with .NET for over a year at this point. So Microsoft was kind of assisting, because you're not a Microsoft employee. Correct. Uh, they were just assisting to understand C-sharp as language so that you could be writing more books like this one. Yeah, they're hoping that I'm writing more books, and, um, you know, I kind of help with, uh, I find bugs, and uh, I sit in some spec meetings and things like that and talk to people. So I kind of feel like I've had more of a part than just writing about it, but mm -hmm. actually contributing to it to some degree as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you, you know, when I first started, the first thing I was interested in was this new language that I'd be using to write all the code that I knew I'd be writing for, you know, the foreseeable future. Let's put it that way. And uh, <laughs> um, I, coming from a very strong C, C++ background, I would say I felt pretty proficient in C Sharp after one week of reading the docs and the, the programming reference and so on. And I was really able to produce some useful stuff within a week. After just one week? Yeah, after just one week. Because it is very similar to C++. You know, the braces are there the same, the return values are the same, parameters are the same. Um, everything, a lot of things, are pretty much uh, the same. You just kind of lose some of that freaky naming convention they've got going on with objects and destructors and constructors and, and double colons and junk like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Instead of double colon, everything's a period. And instead of arrows, it's a period. So <laughs> they've simplified the language quite a bit. <laughs> um, so um, it's been really easy for me. And it's still periodically, I still have to go back to the language reference and maybe look up how to overload an operator or some general, you know, more obscure things I'm less likely to do when I write programs. But uh, for the most part, it's just very natural to me now. It really just flows. Now, since you've been working with Free, have you noticed the language itself uh, evolving over that year time, or was it was it pretty much the same a year ago as it was today? Um, I say it's pretty much the same, but there's definitely been little tweaks, and there's certainly been very responsive in the Beatty cycle. There was a lot of things about non-deterministic destructor uh, destruction of objects and things like that, and so uh, the base class library has added an iDisposable interface that I think will appear in Beta 2, not in Beta 1, and C# -sharp has added some new language construct to um, help you get. Uh, something closer to deterministic destruction of objects. So I would say that uh, Microsoft's been pretty closely following what people have been saying about the language, and they have been responsive to trying to add new things to it. Uh, I also know that in the future, after version 1, they're going to be adding um, generics, which is kind of like templates in C++, and I'm sure C Sharp is going to evolve in order to support those. Mm -hmm. And actually, when it's in the common language runtime, all the languages will be able to use generics. Well. Do part of that, and so they're yes. every, since it's a common language runtime, have access to all that functionality. Now, Precisely. what do you think of, of, of C-sharp as a language overall? 
Um, well, as I said, it's, it's very similar to C++, and so I felt right at home with it um, very quickly. Um, it's very, very clean. I would say it's very clean. You know, coming from a C++ background, especially as a Windows C++ programmer, um, ANSI owns the C++ specification. Microsoft wants to keep tweaking to the language in order to expose features that are in Windows and make them kind of look like first-class citizens in the language. But they never really get there. And Microsoft keeps adding things like underbar, underbar, try, and underbar, underbar, finally, and there's underbar, there's underbar, there's underbar there's decal spec. You're right, and C++, right. yes. So the language looks kind of... Well, hideous after a while. Um, and you never quite know, you know, with things like const or whatnot, does the star go in front or the star go after when you're declaring a pointer to something or, a, God forbid, a constant pointer. You'll never figure out where, the, where to put those modifiers <laughs> on the line. I always have to look that stuff up. So um, in C Sharp, uh, since Microsoft has created it um, prior to proposing it to ECMA for standardization, um, it's really clean. There is nothing. It starts with an underbar underbar, <laughs> for example. Um, and of course, since there's really no pointers, per se, in uh, the .NET runtime, therefore um, you don't see asterisks and ampersands and those type of adornments all over your code. So when you just look at it, it just looks clean and crisp, and you just have a really good feel. Um, but don't different. you feel you're, you're missing something? I mean, like, when I was programming in C, I mean, I, I know I, I, I love doing things with pointers. I mean, you just had all sorts of fun things you could do with them by, by reclassing them and using more pointer arithmetic and junk like that. Don't, don't you miss that with C-sharp? Well, I'm, I have to admit, I, I've always been a bit of a bit twiddler myself. And um, sometimes I kind of miss that. Of course, with C-sharp uh, and the .NET framework in general, you can always interoperate out to some other language. So if I really need to do that type of thing, I can write it in C++ instead of in C-sharp. C Sharp also does offer an unsafe keyword. So you can make a method and say this is unsafe, and you can have access to pointers and do some direct memory manipulation in that. Um, although I personally have never actually had to use that. Uh, as far as um, fun goes in coding, the .NET Framework and the Base Class Library offers just a ton of features that make programming fun. Um, so while I don't have things like reserving virtual memory and sparsely committing it or working with memory map files in the .NET framework, at least not directly, you can do it through interop, um, there are still other things like serialization um, and web services and other things that are fun to produce really valuable uh, applications, really powerful and rich. Now, in your, in your classes you're teaching and stuff like that, are you doing any C-sharp classes yet? Yes. In fact, uh, just this week, I taught my first uh, .NET programming with C-sharp class. And that, there were two people in the room that were visual basic programmers, not even object-oriented programmers. And I didn't really give an introduction to C-sharp, the language per se, because uh, really I mostly focus on the common language runtime in the base class library. And uh, I'll say more about that a little bit later. But um, the VB programmers during the labs, they had very little trouble picking up the C-sharp language and actually uh, doing them and being productive. And I was quite surprised myself. And some of that would be because in, in C-sharp, you've just got the name dot name dot name dot name rather than the name arrow name dot name arrow name dot star asterisk yeah, parent sure. and, <laughs> and all sort of junk, which yes. they wouldn't have used in VB. Correct. So the, the format looked fairly similar to them. Um, yeah. Yeah, fairly similar. Of course, they had braces instead of begin and end. You know, that may have thrown some of them. But I think it didn't take them more than five minutes or so to get over that and uh, be able to be more productive. Mm -hmm. Now, um, from, a, from a corporation standpoint, uh, if a corporation was coming to you and wanted to have a class on C Sharp, so I got to find out whether they should start thinking about moving some of their development efforts over to C Sharp, is that something you'd recommend that they do, or in what stages do you think? Well, they certainly, do? it depends on. Um, first, they have to decide they want to adopt the .NET framework as their development platform, um, and I think there's a lot of value there, and there's no question for me that that's really where I want to be. If you're developing for the .NET framework and you are writing new code, it just seems to me like it's a no-brainer. Um, it's really easy to pick up. The language is crisp. You're very productive in it right away. Um, so I would strongly suggest C Sharp. I also uh, personally believe that a lot of VB programmers, VB6 programmers, will migrate to C Sharp more so than VB7. Why, why, that? why is that? Because I think C Sharp is, um, it just exposes more of the functionality in the common language runtime to you. You have a little bit more control over the code and the way that you express it. You're more directly talking to the runtime. Mm -hmm. And that gives you more uh, power. Mm -hmm. Of course, and, you know, neither one of us are VB programmers per se, so That's we're true. obviously going to go That's through true. C. <laughs> so uh, I suppose we're kind of biased in that standpoint. Yes. Um, now, what are some of the aspects of, of C Sharp that, that you really like as, as a language, some of the more simpler, just you know, clean programming aspects? Um, 
Well, mostly it's the, the stuff that's been removed. The things like, um, well, C Sharp doesn't allow you to declare uh, parameters as const, and you can't have a const instance method, which you could have in C++. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some people will think of that as a really missing feature of the language. Um, but the fact is in C++, const could always be casted away, and then you're able to do anything within your code anyway. Um, since C Sharp doesn't really allow you to use const and put it there, it's, again, just clean and easy to follow. Mm -hmm. you know, I think I should say that um, to me, uh, what's really interesting about the .NET frameworks is you have this common language runtime that defines how objects behave, or how you define, how you create types, and what defines the behavior of those types. The, then you have the base class library, which is, of course, this enormous library that just gives you access to a lot of things, so you don't have to rewrite, the, rewrite everything over and over again, reinvent the wheel, if you will. Um, the language that you choose is really just a personal choice. And I've chosen C Sharp because it's um, a really good high-level language. It lets me talk to the framework. But really, the best language to use the .NET runtime in the base class library would, in a way, be the intermediate language assembly language. Assembly language returns, huh? <laughs> yeah, assembly <Right>. language returns. <laughs> um, I mean, the back is going to give you full access to the underlying platform that's underneath. But it's difficult to be productive in assembly language environment. There's so many individual lines that you must write yourself. So uh, C Sharp is like the next level away. And there are things in C Sharp where the designers of it, such as Anders, um, has decided to, that this wasn't a really uh, commonly used feature. And therefore, they didn't necessarily expose it in C Sharp. So in some cases, I might resort to another language in order to get access to a runtime feature that C Sharp doesn't provide. Mm -hmm. But in general, C Sharp is, um, the highest level language that allows me to do as much bit twiddling as I feel that I need in this environment and be really productive. Mm -hmm. It is not, you know, not all the bit twiddling, just, you know, most of it? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's very rare yeah. that I need to get access to, to something else that C Sharp doesn't let me mm -hmm. get access to. And this is another thing that I think it's just very easy for people to forget, is that when you want to get access to some feature that C Sharp or some other language for .NET doesn't provide you, you can switch to another language. Just code that method up, maybe a static method in a class in APL or in COBOL or whatever language of your choice, or maybe derive, mm -hmm. um, and then implement some instance method in some other language, and that language maybe does give you access to some feature underneath. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very powerful paradigm that we never really had before to choose the best language for getting the job done. Mm -hmm. I bet you know some of our audience might want to see some some examples of, of some C sharp code to understand some of the things we're talking about. You maybe have some examples. You yeah, can I did bring with me um, a source code file that just has some sample code in it that I could kind of walk through a little bit. And uh, after the session, I'll give it to you. You're welcome to post it on the website so people can download it. Okay, if you'd like. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> So here, the uh, first thing I'm going to show is that uh, in C-sharp, every method has to be in a class. There is no um, global methods and there are no variables that can be outside of a class. So everything has to be scoped within. So this very simple is the obligatory Hello World program, where I have a class called app. And inside this class, I have my main method. And main is a static method because it's going to be called from outside, you know, externally. We don't have an instance of app to use in order to call main. Main, in my example here, returns void and it takes no parameters. And simply inside it, it calls console write line to display hello world out to the console. So this is pretty much the smallest program that you could write and, you know, learn some things about. So now, is, is main still a reserved uh, method name in C Sharp like it is in uh, C++? Uh, main with capital M, lowercase a-i-n, because C Sharp is a case-sensitive language like C++, but unlike VB in .NET, um, is the default. So when the compiler compiles the code, it's looking for a static method called main, and that's what it's going to use. Mm -hmm. But there is a command line switch you can override it and pick a different one. And okay. in fact, that's a useful um, tip, by the way. Some people put multiple mains in a single application to component test. Mm -hmm. And when you compile, you can compile the different switch to run a different main to test that particular component. Oh, good tip. Yeah. Now, do you also have like an argv, argc parameter that are by default passed to this function? Uh, yeah, you can optionally, here I'll modify the code live, uh, say string, oh, it's an array of strings, args. Um, and it's defined um, as I show here on the slide. So what this is, by the way, is um, this is the data type. It's a pointer to an array of strings, or a reference to array of strings. Um, I said pointer, but you don't actually see the asterisk, but it really is a pointer to it. Uh, when main is called, the um, startup code, if you will, has already parsed the command line and created an array of strings and passed the pointer to the array in. Now from within here, it's just very easy I could... Um, 
do something like call args.length, and that would return to me the length property on the array, would return to me the number of elements that are in the array, and then I could just iterate it through it using a normal for loop, or C Sharp has a for each, special for each statement for doing quick iterations. That's new, that was in C or C++. That's correct. Um, and I do have some code that demonstrates that as well. Let me go and find it here. So uh, here, uh, here's an example of some code that works with arrays. Um, so I'll walk through this a little bit. Um, first, I'm declaring a reference to an array of in32s in this example. IA, for integer array, if you will, um, is just a pointer, a 32-bit value or a 64-bit value, if this are running on a 64-bit system. And that is always initialized to null. References are always initialized to null until you explicitly set them. Um, on the next line here, I'm newing up or constructing, if you will, an array of 100 in 32 values. New returns the reference to that, which I'm then storing in this IA variable. Um, this on this next line, I just show an alternate way of doing this, where I'm newing, again, an array of in 32s, and then this uh, special C sharp syntax, which is a little awkward when you first see it for the first time, <laughs> um, has an open brace followed by the uh, elements of the array, comma separated, of course, then a closed brace. So that's just another way of doing it. And here, of course, it figures out the number of elements. And that's just that predefining your array. values. Yes, that's correct. So now here's the, the for each, which is what brought me to this code in the first place. Uh, for each is a C sharp syntax. I'm sure all the languages, .NET languages, will offer it because it's a very common uh, programming paradigm where you have some set of elements and you wish to iterate over them. So here I'm saying for each int 32x, so x is my variable, int 32 is of course the type in, and then I give my reference to the array here. So for each will automatically figure out how many elements in the, in the array and write the additional code to each time it loops around go to the next element. Um, and that'd be the same sort of thing as saying, you know, for i equals zero, i is less than ia dot length, i plus plus which is kind of an awkward format if all you want to do is walk everything. So yeah. I'm constantly doing that exact same thing all the time. And I think this would be a lot easier. Right, precisely. Although I, I'll uh, give you this little tip <laughs> out there, and that is that a lot of times, because for each is kind of cool, and it's really nice, you know, it saves you a lot of coding. Um, it also does another thing relating to casting, which is nice for you to have as well. So I generally, when I'm writing a loop, I usually start out with for, eight, for each. And then as I'm working on my code, I then sometimes, frequently, I later find out that I need an iterator. I need an X that goes from zero to the actual number. I need to know oh, the, which the element number. number. Yes. Yeah. So I end up rewriting this loop quite frequently. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, I do. As, so, as a standard for loop. Yeah, as a standard for loop, right. So sometimes uh, it ends up being more work <laughs> than what I originally thought it was going to be. But um, when it does work, and it is pretty frequent, it's, uh, it's really nice to have. <laughs> I suppose you could have just had a counter you stuck in there as well, but then that would have totally avoided the, the fact of having this for each to begin with. Yes, yeah, no that's counter. right. <laughs> so what are some of the cool things you think that uh, the C Sharp has that, that our audience would say, well, you know, that's the language for me? Um, well, uh, as Andrew pointed out in the earlier segment, um, it is you know very component based. It has uh, events in there, it has interfaces in there, it has properties in there, and they're all first class citizens. So there's no underbar underbar property or, or anything like that that's in there. Um, people out there should certainly get familiar with exception handling because all error uh, processing in the framework and the base class library is done by doing errors. So here I have on the screen a little bit of code demonstrating how to do proper error handling. Um, I have a try block, and again, you'll notice there's no underbars in front of the word try, because it's first class um, in the uh, language. Um, I'm newing a file stream object, which is a way to open a file on the disk. And here in quotes, I've given the path name of the file that we wish to open. Now wait, here's wait, wait, wait. That's, that's an error, though, isn't it? Uh, no, this is uh, just what I was about to point out. Is there's this very cool C sharp feature where uh, you can prefix a string with an at sign, and that turns this into a verbatim string, which allows me to just use a single backslash here instead of the double backslash. And for long paths, that's oh, really wow, a very yeah. common uh, C++ programming error. People put in single backslashes instead of two, mm -hmm. and it doesn't open properly. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case here, it would have been backslash n, which would have been a new line. All hell would have broken <laughs> loose. So <laughs> uh, this is a really nice feature. So if uh, file stream 
Um, unlike, you know, for people familiar with Win32 uh, create file function, when that function fails to open the file, it returns invalid handle value or minus one to indicate a failure. In the .NET framework, when we try to open this file and it doesn't exist, this will throw an exception. So I have a, a catch here where I try to catch the exception. My very simple catch just displays a message out to the console, which probably you wouldn't do. You'd probably do something else. Um, and then I have finally, which is code that's guaranteed to execute, so um, if I have more lines of code in the try that actually use the file after having opened it, the finally would go and explicitly close the file later on. This is also a really nice thing that Win32 um, and even C++ doesn't have, which is the ability to have a try, a catch, and a finally all as one clause to really sum up um, you know, this operation. We never had that before. And error handling, I think, you know, is pretty important for people to do in their application. As they get more and more complex, there's just, you know, more possible things that could possibly go wrong in trying to, trying to create a file or something like that, yeah. um, especially using other people's objects and so forth like that. Now, does this also mean that in, in writing a C-sharp application, you need to make sure that your, your functions and methods are, are uh, properly setting the exception and throwing an exception out so people can catch it? Well, absolutely. If When you write a function, you know, good programming paradigm states that you uh, validate all the parameters that get passed to you. And if any of those parameters are not what you expect them to be, then you should definitely throw an exception. Mm -hmm. And there are a ton of exception classes already defined in the base class library, so it's easy for you to just use an existing one. But you also ha do have the ability to define your own exceptions. Maybe a, you're looking for a customer in a database and you don't seem to find their name. You could create your own bad customer exception and throw that somewhere in your code. Or even like the customer's name, perhaps, his bad name of customer. Yeah, something like, like that, right? If it's Robert, <laughs> you want to always want to throw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's Robert. <clears throat> so where do you think, you know, C Sharp is going um, as a programming language? Um, uh, what are you noticing your, 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 your customer is doing when they're taking your classes and so forth like that? What do they think of it? Well, I really think it's going to gain an enormous amount of momentum. Um, as I said, I've been pretty much programming in exclusively for the past year. Occasionally, I'll do a C++ thing, but uh, very rarely now. And um, I also tend to believe a lot of VB programmers will move over to the language as too, because it lets them tap more into the common language runtime and functionality that's there. Um, so uh, I really think it's going to gain an enormous amount of momentum and really be used heavily. Mm -hmm. um, in my classes, certainly, everybody seemed to enjoy it. In fact, some people said they came to the class because they thought it was C-sharp uh, programming class only, but then they were happy to find out cover that <laughs> frameworks in the class library as well. So speaking of the, of the .NET framework and class libraries, what do you think, think of those and, and how they're, they're assisting in application development? I mean, the, the platform, uh, I think, is just phenomenal. Um, I've been using the whole platform for a year, and uh, there's a large project that i was uh, been working on recently uh, for Microsoft to be kind of a showcase for um, lots of Microsoft technologies. And um, I was working on it with one other guy, his name was Tom, and we would get together in the morning and we would go on a whiteboard and we would say, so here's the kind of features we're going to add today, and we would discuss it for a while, and we would say, so this is going to be our goal for the end of the day, and usually before lunch would be completely done. We always m beat our expectations of having it done. We were in shock. Do you would, think that was a combination of C Sharp and .NET that was assisting you in doing that? Oh, for sure. There's no question. Because all the plumbing is gone. All the, you know, how do we expose this thing? Should we make this a, a method? Should we make it a co an, in a DLL? Should we make it a COM object? What type of interface should we have? Um, all those kind of issues of how do you wire this up and pass the pointers around and hold on to something so you can sync and get a sync to somebody else to notify them. All of those issues are just built right into this platform. So... Um, we were always, we'd like work for an hour, we'd get something done, we'd be amazed, we'd stand up and we'd high ten each other, and then we'd sit back down and we'd start to add something else. It was just incredible how our productivity, wow. and it was so much fun too. We were really adding, doing amazing things with graphics and alpha blending and all kinds of stuff, which I'd never done before, alpha blending kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'd work with graphics, but it had been many years, mm -hmm. and using the uh, system dot drawing classes in that namespace. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to construct these images and overlay them and alpha blend on them and then send them back from our web server back to any client running on any machine. Doesn't even have to be a uh, Windows machine. I guess you know, it kind of brings up a good option. I mean, like, so far we've been talking about you know, application development using C Sharp and the .NET framework and like that. And I know that you're a, you're a true application programmer writing Windows application, standard GUI stuff. Um, well, you know, all of a sudden we've had you know, the web has come up and everyone's thinking about writing web applications or HTML-based applications running inside of a browser. Um, 
but now you meant you you in one word there your one one description of your product you're talking about having this alpha blended standard windows graphical application but then also accessing the web and tossing things to other systems in that fashion um, how do you view the, the traditional application development environment and people like you and I who, who develop Win32 applications and so forth and this new web application model blending together with .NET? Well, actually for this uh, particular thing I was doing, it wasn't a Win32 graphical app. It was uh, a web form, if you will. Oh. Yeah, it was a web form. So it wasn't even a traditional Windows application? Well, it, it sounded like it. Really though. what it was, it actually has a more complicated arch, um, architecture to it than that. Uh, it was actually a web service. Uh, and I think it's one of the first um, public Microsoft web services that's free. So I'll, I'll give you the URL. <laughs> so anybody can go to it and they can fiddle with it. And it's a terraserver.microsoft.net. Okay. okay, and I'll put that at the bottom of the transcript so people can take oh, them. That's good. Click on that. Um, so that is a poster child for a lot of Microsoft technologies, including Windows 2000 Data Center and SQL 2000 and IIS and ASP.NET and the .NET frameworks and web services and, all, and web forms. All that stuff is on that site. Um, so we built, this guy Tom and I, um, three web services that are on that site. There's a... Um, Terra server web service that has mapping information and shows imagery and tiles um, in uh, relief map, topographic maps, and, and regular images, photos. Then we also have a census service, so you could go there and put in a latitude, longitude kind of thing, get the city back and number of people lived in that area. And we also had a landmark service, so giving a rectangle in latitude, longitude, you could then get back all the hospitals or schools that are within that particular region. So it's three separate web services. They could have been implemented by different companies, but they were really all implemented by us. Um, then we wrote a web form app, which could have been written by any company, but again, was written by us as proof of concept. And it spoke to those three different web services and could get the tile information from Terra server, get the uh, landmark information from the landmark server, and then we were able to overlay them on the map. Using alpha blending. Yeah, well, yes, using alpha blending. And then that was sent back in a web form back to a client running on any machine. We even added the stuff so if you hover over something, the tooltip would come up and tell you the name of that school or the name of that hospital that was on the page. Um, this is, uh, well, I thought it was an incredibly powerful paradigm. Um, the fact that the client could be any machine running any operating system at all, and we were using the Windows 2000 features in its GDI Plus for doing alpha blending and those types of, um, those types of advanced graphics manipulations on the server, but then we just sent over the bitmap back to the client. I think that was incredibly powerful, and again, we were incredibly productive. I see a lot of applications moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. So you really like the, the whole web model of doing web applications? I do. Yeah. Even though you're a traditional Windows application developer, you're, yeah. you you get the bullet and you're, you're going in the direction. I now. have. It's it just runs everywhere. Mm -hmm. It runs everywhere and doing this work on the server and then the distributedness of the whole thing, right? As all of these, the the servers could have been on three separate machines. Oh, and then the SQL Server that made all the stuff could have been on yet another machine, and the web form server. Um, could have been on yet a different machine and could be fine-tuned by different companies to use this material in any way that they see fit to produce these really rich apps that run literally anywhere where you have internet access. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. It was yeah. just incredible. <laughs> Something tells me you're impressed by all this. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, are there any, you know, you know, final remarks you think that uh, a developer on the audience, you know, someone out there that's on the edge of his seat, you know, wanting to get into C Sharp and wanting to start writing some of these .NET applications needs to to really understand before they take some of their first steps? I think one of the biggest issues that's going to come up for developers out there is that they have to realize, or and they'll probably just learn this from experience over time, that the language is exposing the features that are in the runtime in the base class library. And a lot of people will look at C Sharp and maybe they'll try to do, or some other .NET language, and maybe they'll try to do something that that language doesn't provide, and they'll therefore think that's just not possible. Like, for example, in C Sharp, by default, uh, well, in C Sharp, all arrays are based at zero, zero indexed. Mm -hmm. um, but the common language runtime supports arrays that have any lower bound and any upper bound. So there is a way in C Sharp, but really you kind of leave C Sharp and you go to the base class library, to construct an array that can have a lower bound you set and an upper bound that you set. But C Sharp naturally doesn't provide that for you. So you just have to learn over time what it is. And a lot of times you're able to... Um, maybe use some other language or get access to the underlying system that a 
language on top of the runtime for some reason that designers have chosen to not give you access to. So it's, I mean, similar to, by understanding the capabilities underlying runtime and all the features there, you can then map that to whatever language you're currently using and understand whether or not it's giving you the power you want. Yeah. And like, for example, when, when I write web pages, I always write it in raw HTML because I know what the capabilities are. But if I had to write it in front page, I know that front page has its own mindset of what it, what it looks at the web page yeah. wise. And I know what it can and can't provide to me. And every once in a while, I've got to jump back to raw HTML and add something in that fashion or other tools. It's the same thing that it right, seems same like. Thing. And sometimes the feature is there too, but it goes under a different name. For yeah. example, in the common language runtime, um, uh, a virtual function is called family. And then to create a virtual function in uh, C-sharp, you would say protected. Right? Or not protected, but it's protected, protected is in C-sharp with the equivalent of family in the uh, gets uh, common language right? runtime. Yeah. Yes, it gets confusing. <laughs> See, already I'm, I'm messed up. But it sounds, so it sounds like the base idea is just yeah. get to understand what the tools you're working with and how well they have operation underneath to the yeah. .NET framework. Yes. Well, thanks a lot, Jeffrey. I really enjoyed talking with you again. And uh, I'll have you back on the show again sometime in the future. Well, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me. So that's how the programmer thinks about C Sharp and the .NET framework. Hopefully, Jeffrey gave you some good information that you can use in understanding your development aspects. He talked about a couple of URLs and some sample source code and stuff like that. I'll be sure to include that at the end of the transcript. So stay tuned for the rest of the show and see what's going on. Microsoft is, of course, known for its operating systems, applications, and server products, but I'm sure most of you out there, or many of you out there, your true passion lies with the fun stuff, games. With me today is Adam Walks. He is Product Unit Manager of Role Playing, Adventure, and Technology. And right away, with a name like that, I know your group must be tons of fun. We have lots of fun. So tell me a little bit about the group and your position and what you do there. Well, I'm the Proc Unit Manager, which means that I have most of uh, the functional areas, dev, test, and program management that report to me. And uh, we do role-playing games primarily, uh, adventure games. So the kinds of games that, you know, typically young boys play, uh, lots of Dungeons & Dragons sort of uh, environments and things mm -hmm. such as that. So, but, of course, we all are pl game players as well, so we have a lot of fun while doing our, jo our jobs. Sure. So what type of games is, has your group come out with so far? Um, well, the biggest one we've done recently is called Asheron's Call, which is a what we call a massively multiplayer online role-playing game where uh, any night uh, in the evenings there's probably 15 or 16,000 people that are up on the internet playing this game, and they're in a world with thousands of other people mm -hmm. exploring the world, looking for treasure, killing monsters, working together, things such as that. So it's an exciting uh, environment for people to be playing in. That's excellent. So what, kind, what type of games is your group working on for the future? Um, we're working on a game called Dungeon Siege, which is another role-playing game, although it's not on the internet. And that's a game where you essentially have to try to uh, kill the evil that has taken over your land. And it's a, a, a process where you start out as the farm boy, and you're in your farm, and uh, the monsters come in and, you know, kill your chickens and burn down your house, and so you're angry. So you have to go and try to figure out why they come out of the mountains, and you slowly make your way around the world mm -hmm. and find this ultimate evil uh, bad guy, and you have to, you know, take him out. So what would you say is the most challenging aspect of your job right now? Um, you know, probably the biggest challenge is, is really discerning the, the hits from the, the misses, as it might be. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's just like the movie industry that, you know, you can't tell for sure what people are going to get excited about and what really catches people. And so it's really mm -hmm. kind of an art to kind of find the game and look at it and say, you know, that's it. That game's going to be a big seller. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sign those guys up and make it happen. So, so how, do you, how do you take customer feedback into play with the type of games that you're designing for the future? Well, versus just your own ideas of what you think would make a good game. We have a number of steps that we actually uh, bring people in and, and get their feedback on very early a lot of times. We have mm -hmm. focus groups early on. We just did some of those for the Xbox products that we're working on, mm -hmm. where we'll take our target audience. In this case, we had two different groups, uh, 16 to 18 and 19 to 24. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of talked to them without them knowing it's Microsoft or without them knowing about what the game is exactly. We ask them and we show them the art and we say, hey, is, is this cool or not? You know, What mm -hmm. do you like about this? What don't you? So that's kind of the first step is when we do focus groups. And then we kind of go back and take that feedback into account and come out with a beta product where we essentially give it out more broadly and let people actually play the real game. Mm -hmm. And then there's news groups and uh, we chat with a lot of people and understand again, you know, what things do you like, what things don't you like, is there something that, you know, we should change to make the game cool. And we have some time to do that and then we actually ship the game. So we have a couple, two or three different times that we get, you know, user feedback. As we move forward with like second versions and stuff, of course, we really listen to the user community that, mm -hmm. uh, from the first version um, and try to make the games, you know, uh, appeal to those guys again to make them buy it a second time. Right, sure. So what, what, what is your favorite Microsoft game? 
Uh, well, I'd have, of course, say Asheron's Call because it was ours. <laughs> sure. Um, another game that I love to play is uh, Age of Empires, The Conquerors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a new game that just came out recently, and we actually play a lot of that at work because that's a real-time strategy game, and so we typically will have six or eight of us, and <clears throat> after, the, uh, after we're done with our day, we'll actually play for research. an hour or two and yeah. do research as it might yeah. be. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's a great game as well. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you must play a lot of games outside of work. I do. Um, my wife actually usually goes to bed about 8.30, and I play from 8.30 until about midnight or 1 o'clock <laughs> in the morning. So uh, it's amazing she lets me do that, but she does. And, of course, it's research for work, so, mm -hmm, uh, sure. so it's important to my job. So what other hobbies do you have outside of work? Um, I do a lot of you know, hiking and camping. One thing I enjoy is... Uh, um, uh, we, I've just bought some chain mail, so we, for like Halloween, cost costuming, things such as that. Um, so I, my son and I both went as knights this year for mm -hmm. Halloween. We were fully decked out in our chain mail and our swords and helms and things such as that. Right. So that's another thing that I enjoy is, you know, learning about, uh, you know, earlier times, medieval times and mm -hmm. how people lived and the kinds of things they did and things such as that. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely incorporate that to your work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Of course, I've played Dungeons and Dragons and Role Master and right. things such as that for years and years as well as a, as a kid and still today. Right. Sure. So uh, you said hiking. Do you like hiking in the Northwest? Mm -hmm. It's a great place to do that, of course, living here. Yep. Are you a native, Seattle native? Uh, actually born and raised in Seattle. I'm one of the few ones one here at few. Microsoft. It's true. Yep. yep. So. so before you were product unit manager at Microsoft, what other types of jobs have you done here and how long have you been here? Uh, I've been here something on the order of 13 years, uh, so quite a while. Yeah. I'm one of the old timers. Um, I started out in product support doing C programming support and uh, moved from there into the developer relations group that kind of talked about our future operating systems to the development community. Mm -hmm. Then moved into uh, the MSN group where I was a program manager and then decided, you know what, I've been here 10 years, I want to go do something that's really fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. And so at that point I moved into the, uh, into the games group and started working on the Internet Gaming Zone, uh, which is a place where people get together and play all kinds of different games from, you know, the hardcore games like Asheron's Call to Hearts and Bridge and Cribbage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we've, I've moved on from that onto uh, role, this role-playing adventure and technology group. Right. So how would you say, or, or what would you say you picked up and learned from the previous job that helped you with your current job? Oh, man. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's always been a learning process, and it seems in every job that I've taken, I've always learned a lot. I mean, first of all, I think, you know, the technical underpinnings of doing the C stuff very early on mm -hmm. and understanding the operating systems. I was actually one of the original uh, Windows OS 2, or OS 2, um, support guys. So I was essentially one of the guys that helped people write OS2 applications and then moved on to Windows NT and, and essentially was one of the original evangelists for Windows NT. So really learning a lot about operating systems, what they can do. Mm -hmm. Understanding the technical underpinnings was really important. Um, a, as I moved into like MSN, really understanding the internet and where the internet was going and how that could impact gaming was something mm -hmm. that was important to me. And seeing kind of the vision of how that could affect the gaming world and coming over and working on the internet gaming zone. So. Mm -hmm. And then through that, you know, as I played a lot of games and things such as that, I've, I've you know, grown, uh, you know, comfortable with understanding the games market and where it's going and, right. and ready to kind of hopefully do this job well. Right. Where would you say the future of gaming is heading at Microsoft or in general? Um, well, I, I, you know, I'm biased, of course, but I think that the online space is where you're really going to see a lot of additional uh, innovation, a lot mm -hmm. of additional excellent stuff. Like that in the Xbox, probably. Let me talk about um, the online space first. I mean, when you play in, in a game against an artificial intelligence, you know, that's fun. Mm -hmm. But when you can play against other real humans, it's a lot more fun. So, sure. uh, you know, it's always exciting because you're kind of exploring someone else's mind and trying to figure out how you can find the hole in their defense or whatever. So that's fun. Uh, the other really exciting thing that we're doing right now is uh, Xbox. So mm -hmm. we're working on a console uh, that's going to come out for Microsoft. And um, that's kind of a whole new environment that Microsoft's not been in before. And so uh, we're working on a number of games for that console. And that's exciting, too, because moving into a new environment with new kinds of games and, uh, and it's just exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam, it sounds like you have an incredibly exciting job here at Microsoft. And thanks for taking the time to talk with me today about it. I'm sure you've made many developers day out there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, that's been another episode of the MSDN Show. Hopefully, you understand a little bit more about the C-sharp programming language and how it can help you write better applications. Stay tuned for the next episode on ASP.NET. And until then, we'll see you on the web.